Hello, I'm in Oxford today at the Oxford Oratory. In fact, I'm sitting in the Oratory Library with a very special guest. Aidan Mackey is a Chestertonian of many, many decades. Aidan, welcome to the show. Aidan, where, where, where are you from originally? Uh, I was born and, and brought up in Manchester, about two miles from the city centre, in a rather interesting society. Um, working class but mixed, uh, the people next door owned their own house and they owned our house and one or two others and could easily have moved away to a large house but no, this was where they belonged and we were mixed, uh, Catholic, Methodist, Church of England, Baptist and all good neighbours. I knew at the age of three I could toddle into any house and get a chocolate biscuit and things like that and I was one of a large family but I was only six years old when our good father died. So the, I had to leave school at the age of 14 and start bringing in a few shillings a, a week. So that was not the limit by any means of my education, but of my actual schooling. So I am not a scholar or an academic. And I came into contact to an older brother with Chesterton in 1936, just before my 14th birthday, and I, I haven't stopped since. I count myself as being the oldest and the noisiest Chestertonian. So t t tell me a little bit about uh, your working life. I believe you're, you're a teacher, a headmaster eventually. Yes, I, I did several odd jobs in packing in a boot and shoe warehouse and things like that. And then uh, I was introduced to the firm of Burns Oates, who were church furnishers, publishers, still publishing today, and so on. And I uh, ran the bookshop as part of their Manchester store there. And that was lovely. It was a s small, well-furnished room with armchairs and a table, visited by many uh, of the clergy, Anglican and Catholic particularly, and so on. And I steeped myself in Chesterton there and I was there until I um, went into the services during the war and I returned there when it, um, the government finally decided they could carry on without my services. So how, how did you end up a teacher then? Ian? Well I was visiting a, a friend uh, about 19... 49, 48, and whilst I was there, he, there was an aunt of his visiting who was a very experienced teacher, the uh, deputy head of a large school. And I was explaining something to two toddlers there. And this lady turned to me and said, Aidan, you've got to be in teaching. I said, well, they wouldn't have me because I had no qualifications, things like that. But there was a time uh, an emergency scheme where we did the whole two and a half years in 15 months by working evenings and weekends and no holidays and things like that and uh, at the end of it I was put into a classroom with about 43 nine-year-old children little idea and I chatted to them asked them about themselves and within about 15 minutes I went, this this is my life this is what I want to do Aidan, tell me about the first encounter you had with G.K. Chesterton. That happened in the late summer of 1936 when I was approaching my 14th birthday. I'd been a great reader of adventure stories, cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians and so on. And one day one of my older brothers passed by and looked over my shoulder and with the affectionate guidance that we expect from older brothers said to me, get that great snout of yours out of that rubbish and read something worthwhile. And he gave me Chesterton's novel, The Man Who Was Thursday. I re re realised years later that it was the first adult book I'd ever read. And it fascinated me. And from then I went on to his essays, um, particularly one book, Tremendous Trifles, which in my teaching days I've used with young people a great deal. In one, what I found in my pocket, 
he was travelling on a train, no compartments then, it was a cor no corridor trains, and he'd forgotten to bring a book. So he mused on the things in his pocket, um, it, Battersea tram tickets with short scientific essays on them, which were of course adverts for Beecham's Little Liverpool bills and things like that. And uh, he found uh, the coins and he mused on what we owe to Caesar, and what we owe to God, and his pocket knife. And what is a knife but a short sword? And what is a pocket knife but a secret sword? Now that goes down very well indeed with 11, 12 and 13 year old boys. And I've done that and a number of essays. And I was approached only a couple of years ago by a professional man who'd been in the school uh, in the 1960s. And he remembered my going on about Chesterton and how it started him on it. So that was my introduction to Chesterton. Let's go back to his beginnings. Where was Chesterton born and when was he born? Chesterton was born in London in Kensington. Uh, he was part of the firm of estate agents and land valuers, Chesterton Company, which is still going. But Gilbert would not approve of it now because it's now big business with branches in Australia and other places and so on. And Chesterton was not in favour of big business. No. And, uh, he, and, he, and what sort of family was he born into? What sort of strata of society? Like C.S. Lewis, he had only one sibling, um, uh, a brother. Chesterton did indeed have a younger sister, but she died in infancy. And he and his brother Cecil, who was an important part of Chesterton's life, um, debated and argued endlessly, but, ne but never quarrelled. And uh, it was in Kensington that he came to know in the late 1890s uh, Francis Blog, which is a corruption of the French de Blog, and uh, he married her in 1901. But before that, um, Aidan, just tell us a little bit about his schooling and how he, how he got into his, his eventual line of work. Yeah, uh, he went to St Paul's School and he enjoyed it there and he formed there a debating club, the Junior Debating Club, and many of the friends remained his friends throughout life. There were two sets of Jewish twins, the Davidors and the Solomons, and they kept in warm touch with Chesterton throughout his life. Even though the Davidors moved to Canada, they still, and he met them on one of his trips to uh, that side of the Atlantic. And people who became his friends always wanted to stay that way. And, um, but even at school, he was uh, very absent-minded. It's recorded that he was once walking outside, um, reading a book as he walked round, and one of the masters came to him and said, um, why aren't you in class, Chesterton? Oh, I, I thought it was Saturday. And because it was Chesterton, that was accepted in absolutely truth. With most boys, that would have been a make-up excuse. But he, and there is a, a little drawing he did of himself, carrying and reading a football while kicking a book. And he's marked it as, as absent-minded. Absent yes. of mind, yes. So, um, he left school, and um, where, did, where, where did he go next? Uh, he did not go to university. He went to the Slade School of Art, but they recorded that they taught him very little because his drawing, his artwork was so well formed already, and it's unmistakable. You see one of his characters on a table from yards away, oh, that's Chesterton. And I had many of those through my hands, both originals and copies. And it, he could have made a, a, a fine living just from his artwork. And he did illustrate a good number of books, many of Hilaire Belloc's satirical novels, and uh, his own uh, Greybeards at Play and Nonsense Rhymes, things like that, yes. Did, did, did he complete his studies at Slade? 
he drifted away rather simply because, as I said, they had little to teach him there. And he got into journalism quite early on. How did he, how did he manage, to, how did he get into journalism? Well, he was a friend of, of one of the Hodder family uh, at school, of the, the Hodder and Stoughton publishers, famous publishers, who are still going. And uh, he w worked in the office of Brimley Johnson, a very small publisher, who was also linked with the Chesterton family. And he had a tremendous memory for the books that he'd read. He, he was reading and giving advice to the management on which books were worth considering publication. And he could remember the plots of them many, many years later. And also would have been published some of his letters to Francis dating for that period. So, so he was kind of um, read, reading the, uh, the submissions to, to the publisher, was that his, yes. his role? So how did he transit from that which is very different to, to, to writing and well, journalism. Then he started in journalism writing essays which attracted a good deal of attention. And his very first book, uh, what, a book of essays, was called The Defendant. And that's still a, a very fine introduction to Chesterton's works. Um, that he'd only published that and a book of nonsense verse, Greybeards at Play, when astonishingly, he was asked to do a volume on the poet Robert Browning in the English Men of Letters series, which was an erudite thing written by the Greybeards and great men of the series. And Chesterton had never written a book before. As I say, his book of essays, his book of verse, but never a book. And yet that book, his book on Robert Browning, is the only one of the series that is still reprinted today. All the others are forgotten. When you read the um, the essays in the defendant, um, um, Eden, you, you, you I mean it's quite stark so, or st startling sometimes to read them today and realise that these are the first the real first published pieces of Chesterton yes. because they are so complete and so much a piece of what was to yes. come later. Is that your view when you read them? That you see that are you surprised at how good a writer he was? How quickly? Yes, and in many cases in his early works, was, that could have been written a couple of months ago in, in this century. It's amazing. He never claimed to be a prophet, but he did. In 1917, he wrote, if Bolshevism actually does come to power in Russia, what it will actually build is the greatest bureaucracy the world has ever seen. And many people, what on earth is the fellow talking about? But when the Berlin Wall was collapsed and communism was breaking up, I was visited by two ladies who had been conscripted in, in Moscow as translators for the Moscow State Publishing House. And they told me how um, valuable Cheston had been in the underground, the Samizdat communication. And also, they told me things that people in this country didn't realise that about communism. It was the biggest bureaucracy the world has ever seen. So, talk us through a little bit his uh, literary career and how it blossomed and, 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 and the types of books, the types of literary works he, he was writing in, in say, in, in the Edwardian period and the run-up to the First War. Yeah, this is a, another of the uh, amazing things that the scope of his writings, that his, his book on St. Francis was acknowledged, his book on St. Thomas Aquinas, the Etienne Guisson, the great Thomistic scholar, said it was the greatest book on St. Thomas Aquinas ever written. And yet how it happened was that it was suggested to him and he said to Dorothy Collins, his secretary who became as a daughter, to Gilbert and Francis. Will you go into London and buy a couple of books or so on St. Thomas Aquinas? And she brought them back, four or five of them, she said, and he browsed through them for a while and then dictated that book. Uh, a slim volume, I think, I think it's probably slightly under 200 pages, but still the greatest thing on St. Thomas Aquinas. And then, um, 
his two books on America are still celebrated. But, uh, and then he wrote The Outline of Sanity, which was an introduction to distributism. Um, he wrote a number of novels. The Ball and the Cross is well worth reading because it demonstrates very clearly his generosity to his opponents. So, I mean, when, when you start going through the different genres that yes. Chesterton worked in, um, there are very few writers in that, that have got such breadth. Yes. In, I mean, and, but not just breadth, but depth to, yes. to their work. I mean, he wrote essays, he wrote poems, he wrote, uh, pl he wrote plays, he wrote novels, he wrote uh, historical works, he wrote theological works, he yes. wrote philosophical works. Um, I mean, was he just a genius? Oh yes, he was a genius, all that, yes. And, and what was his genius? What, what would, how would you define his genius? An insight, but he would never claim to be a, a, a prophet or a seer, or, and certainly not claim to be a genius. Talk to me, Eden, about the influence of London upon Chesterton. He was a Londoner, he was born in London, he got married in London, he, the, his early married life yes. was in London. Uh, wh what, what was the influence of London at that time on him? London was a, a great influence of him because it was a meeting place for so many people. So much went on in London. Um, the man who was tired of London is tired of life. That was Samuel Johnson, wasn't it? And he had many friends. But what was not good for him was that he was within call and he was constantly interrupted because everybody loved his company. And they went and one day he and Francis decided that they'd take a day out and they went to the railway station and said, we want to go out in the countryside. So, well, where, where do you want to go? Said the booking car. Well, is there a train coming? And there was a train going to Beaconsfield. So it's quite by chance that they, they went actually to Slough and walked across the fields to Beaconsfield. It would not be possible now, but it was then. And they each separately, unknown to the other, fell in love with the place and thought, this is where we should live. What, what do you think it was, what, what was it about Beaconsfield in, the, in, in, in that period that, that particularly attracted the Chestertons? Well, well, the influence of Beaconsfield struck each of them separately and each thought, this is the place in which I want to live. It had an atmosphere, wide open streets and beautiful surroundings. And they talked about it. They dined at the White Horse Hotel there. And years later, I think 1911, they went to live at um, Overroads, a house near the center of Oxford, which they liked. At. They loved that place, but opposite was a meadow known as Top Meadow. And rumour went round that that was going to be built on by a laundry. And in those days, a laundry meant masses of noise late into the night, early in the morning, clouds of steam and smoke and so on. So they had the idea there, almost certainly Francis' idea, rather than Gilbert's, of buying the place. And they built on it a studio so that they could entertain their friends. And it was a lovely great hall. I've been there many times with a low stage at one end and a minstrel's gallery at the other. Top Meadow as a house grew in bits round it, not in one place. And so it's, Top Meadow was an, an elegant, large, but rather puzzling place because it was built bit by bit, but they loved that house. Talk to me a little bit, uh, Aidan, about the legacy of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Uh, by 1936, uh, where was he in the literary scene and in terms of his, his reputation? And then subsequent decades, how that has waxed and waned, both in England and in America. Yes, he was very, very famed. And as I've said before, he had many opponents and no enemies. H.G. Wells, an atheist, was on record of saying 
if when I die I get to heaven, if such a place exists, then it will be because I can boast of being a friend of Gilbert Chesterton's. And George Bernard Shaw, like many rich men, became a real miser in his old age, even though he was enormously wealthy. But when Chesterton died, um, Bernard Shaw wrote to his widow and said, Gilbert never knew how to handle money. If you're at all short, all I need is figures on a postcard and you'll get it by return. He had great friends like that. And after he died, some years later, the critics tended to abandon him. This is normal with many, if not most, authors. But the public, ordinary people, never stopped reading him. Uh, uh, towards the end of the, the war, I returned to managing the bookshop part of the firm in Manchester, Burns Oates, who were Catholic um, publishers, church furnishers and so on, and they had a bookshop at their Manchester store. And paper rationing was extremely fierce at that time, and no publisher would issue anything unless they knew that it would be bought quickly and eagerly. And yet there I had on my shelves there 11 of Gilbert Chief Chesterton's books in print um, because ordinary people never abandoned him. And slowly he grew back into favour even with the intelligentsia. And now he's quoted constantly all over the place, um, even on television, which is not conducive to the values of Chestertonian people. Talk to me today about where do you feel Chesterton's literary legacy is? His poetry, some of it will certainly survive. There are in the Ignatius Press collection three volumes, not far off uh, 800 pages. No, yes, not far off 800 pages of his poetry alone. I, I started that off doing research on his poems at Top Meadow Cottage, and then it was taken over by Professor Dennis Conlon, who completed the three gate volumes. So would you say that the abiding legacy is now one of a poet? No, his thought and his generosity and his ability to write on serious matters with humour and he was upbraided by a few people on that. Uh, Herbert McCabe, who was um, an opponent of Christianity and so on, rebuked Chesterton for um, writing on serious subjects, but with humour. And Chesterton, in his book Heretics, devotes a chapter to that and very kindly and gently corrects Herbert McCabe on that. And other people felt that at time. But as Chesterton said, humour can only really be about important and serious things. Um, a human being doing something funny is much more humorous than a cat or a dog doing it, because we expect other things. Talk to me a little bit about Chesterton and Francis as a married couple. What, what do they say to today's uh, situation in terms of marriage? Uh, most important thing, extremely important, is Francis Chesterton's wife, upon whom he was so very, very dependent. When they were at a reception, you were standing in little groups, hearing each other, and Chesterton would suddenly turn to the person who was talking about, and say, where is Francis? I, I, I can't see Francis. And they'd say, well, she's over there talking to Mrs. So-and-so, or she's at the supper table, shall I bring her? No, no, I, I don't need her at the moment, but I, I might at any time. He was tremendously, and one of the stories which Dorothy told me that I don't think has been published was that Chesterton went up to uh, Yorkshire to give a couple of talks. And of course, Francis did his packing for him and forgot to include his pajamas. And when he got back after a few days, she apologised for the omission and said, D did you buy another pair? No. Are, are, are pyjamas things that you can buy? 
where he imagined that they came from, heaven only knows, but he, he was. And uh, another story uh, was that Francis and Dorothy were downstairs talking. Gilbert had gone up to have a bath and suddenly they heard, damn it, I've been in here before. And what had happened was that Gilbert had taken his bath and got out, then become lost in thought, looked down and saw the water, so got back into his bath and then only then realised he'd already had his bath. So he was very, very dependent and Francis didn't attempt to publish much of her own stuff, or only in a quiet way. Now, I owe a great deal to Gilbert Keith Chesterton, and I know so many people do, and it's so generally warming to see what's happening. For the colossal work being done in the United States of America, by the society over there, and then the new people in Croatia, in Australia. The one charity that I think that Chesterton himself would love most is the Chesterton Centre in Sierra Leone. John Carnu was one of the food children in his village who had a proper schooling there. He worked so hard that he got to Oxford and took his degree here. He could have made a good, prosperous living here with his, but he realised that this distributism and the social teaching of Chesterton were what his country needed. So he went back to Sierra Leone, started Sierra Leone Chesterton Centre, and it has the government backing and enthusiasm. It has the backing of the Paramount Chiefs, but of course they have very little money. And the beauty of it is that every pound here, sent from here, has 33, 35 times its purchasing value there. And Chesterton would love that because it's doing practical work in his name for God. Ian, thank you very much for taking the time to speak mm. to, to EWTN today. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.